Would you turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1? 2 Peter chapter 1. I couldn't help noticing just a little while ago, I looked at the board and, uh, and looked at those numbers. If you will look at the board for just a moment, there's some uh, very good things about that board. First of all, it tells us our attendance has been spectacular. And, uh, but you know what? All of those numbers, except for one, really won't do much unless there's one on there that really means the most. And I just noticed that number. How many read their Bible daily? 32 people. Folks, if we're a people that, read, that reads uh, the, the living Word of God and we're praying, as this board suggests many of us are doing on a daily basis, that will give us the power through Jesus Christ and the Spirit to do all that God wants us to do. And I noticed that. That is just fantastic. So uh, let us pray that all of us will be involved uh, in reading our Bibles every day and praying to the Lord. In Second Peter chapter 1, um, we have been looking at uh, this passage of Scripture, uh, mainly verses 5 through 7, that uh, uh, tell us that, if we, that all Christians will have these eight characteristics in our life and they will be growing and growing. And uh, we, we're at the point now where we're talking about the sixth characteristic of a Christian that we find in Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 6. It says, in your, And in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness. And that's the word that we're going to cling to this evening is the word godliness. Uh, the title is called The Believer's Purity. Purity and godliness I will use interchangeably this evening. Now, godliness comes from a Greek word which means to be right before God and man. So godliness is being Christ-like. And uh, there are four areas uh, uh, of a real Christian, four areas that if, if you belong in the family of God and if you want to have a, a pure life, a godly life, there will be four areas in your life that, that others will be able to see that will manifest itself. And we're going to talk about those four this evening, but let's begin our time with a word of prayer. Lord, as we look at your word this evening, let us examine our own hearts the way that you would examine our hearts. And Lord, I pray that... As your word is made known this evening, we will examine our heart and, and, and decide whether we're truly growing in you or, or not. And Lord, I pray that every one of us is. As you're doing great things in our church, I also pray that in every life that's here, you will also be doing great things as we yield ourselves to you. Lord, we love you and we praise you this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, the first thing is this. Uh, when, it talks, when we're talking about the believer's purity or living the godly life, the first thing I want to talk to you about is the way of a real Christian. Now, keep in mind there are four things I'm going to bring out this evening that ought to be manifest in a Christian's life uh, that's growing in the Lord. The first one is the way of a real Christian. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 20, it says, So then you will know them by their fruits. If you belong in the family of God, if you're a, a believer of purity, of godliness, then others are going to see in your life some fruits, some evidence of that. Now I want to show you uh, three places in Scripture where the word Christian is used and that it demonstrates the way a real Christian or a godly Christian is and, and it'll demonstrate the fruit that's in their life and hopefully in yours. The first one is this, a believer under control. A believer under control. If you're going to have a, a fruit in your life, one of the ways that that fruit is going to be seen is that you as a believer will be under control. In Acts chapter 11, and verse 26, it says, And when he, referring to Barnabas, had found him, referring to Paul, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year they met with the church and uh, taught considerable numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now, as we look at this verse, and if we were to examine this passage, and we'll not do that this evening, what we'll see here is that Barnabas and Paul and those Christians were believers under control. They were under the control of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit had their life, and they were being directed by the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit in their life. And the way that we see that is the Scripture says they were being taught, and they were edifying and encouraging one another. That is a group of people, that is the individuals being under control, and they were controlled by the Holy Spirit. The second fruit we see is a believer with compassion. A believer with compassion. In Acts chapter 26, verses 28 and 29, it says, Agrippa, uh, Agrippa replied to Paul, and Agrippa is the king, 
In a short time, you will persuade me to become a Christian. See, Paul was talking to him, and Paul could speak so eloquently and, and use the language of the, whoever he was talking to. And, and, uh, and so Agrippa's replying to him, you know, if you keep talking, you're going to turn me into a Christian. And Paul said, I would wish to God that whether in a short or a long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. You see, Paul is talking to the person that could free him. And here he is in chains. He's in bondage. But he's a believer with compassion. Because he is desiring the very person that could set him free, he's desiring that that person would have everything that Paul has, Jesus Christ, and the joy that that brings. And he's saying, not only you, uh, Agrippa, but I would pray that everyone here would know you and realize you as their own Savior. That's a person with compassion. And if that weren't enough, Paul makes the uh, point in the closing of the verse says, except for these chains. He's, see, he wants them to have everything that Paul has. He wants them to be everything that Paul is except the chains. He doesn't want them to be in bondage anymore. You see, Paul had the physical chains on him. But those people around him were the ones that really had the chains. They were the ones that were truly in bondage because they were living apart from Jesus Christ. And so we see in Paul, as hopefully it's made manifest in us, a believer with compassion. If we want to bear fruit, one of the fruits that we'll have is we'll have compassion for other people. And then thirdly, we have a believer in conflict. A believer in conflict. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16, it says, But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. You know, how many of us struggle with that idea? That if we have persecution come our way, we, we think that, um, that God must be punishing us. But if we look at scriptures, the, the, the Christians would say, Lord, thank you that you deemed me worthy to be suffering in your name. How many of us have that same idea, that, that same uh, 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 belief in us that, that we would be worthy, counted worthy, if we could suffer for Jesus Christ and for his namesake? You see, the scripture says, if suffering comes your way, be not ashamed. Because that means God is allowing this to happen to not only uh, uh, purge you, not only to, to bring you to be a more Christ-like person, but He's receiving glory and honor in the process. The way of a pure or godly Christian is living in Christ and bearing fruit. And we see that as a believer is under control, a believer with compassion, and a believer in conflict. If you would turn with me, uh, we want to look in uh, Philippians. If you'll turn to Philippians... Uh, this next point I'm going to make uh, deals uh, in, in Philippians. Now, the first thing we have is we have the way of a real Christian. That is the fruit that is uh, uh, manifest in a Christian's life. Second thing is we have the worth of a real Christian. Now, every one of you that belong in the family of God have a worth. You have value. And we're going to look at that. Now, the, what I want to share with you is that your worth or your value is not based on yourself, your good points. The things that you do, none of those things. Your worth or your value is based on your association with Jesus Christ. You see, you have tremendous value not uh, in yourself apart from anything else, but you have worth and value because of who you're associated with. You belong in the family of God. You belong to Jesus Christ. There are five things I want to mention this evening. The first one is the plan for the believer. Now, your worth as a believer, involves a plan for your life. And there is a plan for you as a believer. If you're looking in Philippians, let's look in verse, uh, chapter 1. Chapter 1 of Philippians, uh, verse 20. According to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. What's the plan for you as a believer? It's to be in Christ. If you look at the end of verse 20, it says, For me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And Paul's saying, I'm going to be, I'm going to live in Christ. Now, if I'm still here in this physical word, I'm going to live in Christ, and I'm going to, and I'm going to do the things He's called me to do. I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to minister to people. I'm going to serve Him in every capacity that I know how to. But I'm still going to be in Christ. But to die is gain. You see, when we leave this earth, we're going to be in the perfection and in the fullness of Jesus Christ. And so we are still in Christ. 
whether we're alive here or whether we're now in heaven and for eternity. The plan for the believer is to be in Christ, in life and in death. Well, the worth of a, of a Christian, of a real Christian, is the prospect for the believer. The prospect for the believer. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 23, it says, But I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Have you struggled with that in, in your life at all? You know, as we're here in this earth and, and things around us seem to be going the wrong way and, and sometimes we're, we're going through tribulations and trials and we say, man, I wished I wasn't here. I wished I was in heaven where all this mess wouldn't be happening. Well, know this. Paul lived through that same thing. He says he was, he was struck from both ends, tugging at him, wanting to be here, to be used of God, and yet wanting to be in that fullness, wanting to be in that perfected state and in the complete glory. And so you are not the only one that struggles with that. Others struggle. Paul struggled with that. See, it's natural to want to be with Christ in fullness. In fact, we should desire that. And so I ask you the question, have you struggled with that? If you answered no, if you never struggle with that, you might want to ask yourself why. Because either you're not saved and belong to the family of God, or you don't have a very close relationship with God. Because if you belong in the family of God and you don't desire to be in heaven in eternity with Him, it may mean you're living a life on your own and you're kind of scared of getting in front of God because of what He's going to say. And so you need to ask yourself, is this something I'm desirous of? If the answer is no, you might want to examine the reason you would say no. Many of us, I think, would struggle with that. Say, yeah, I want to be there, but there's so much that I can do here, so much that I wish God would do through me. And so we struggle with that. And so that's the conflict that we find ourselves in. You and I have worth because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. And so in your worth, there is a plan. And in your worth, there is a prospect. And in your worth, or excuse me, we go on to see the purpose for the believer. There's a plan, there's a prospect, and then there's a purpose for the believer. If you're still in Philippians, if you'll turn to chapter 3, we're going to look at verse 7 and 8. We'll see the purpose for you and for me as a believer. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as a loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. Wow, that's powerful. Paul's saying, you know, all the things of this world, the things that this world has to offer, I consider rubbish. None of it compares to my relationship with Jesus Christ. What is your purpose as a believer? To do all things for Christ. To do all things for Christ. Because anything else that we do is of no lasting value. We can make a lot of money while we're here. We can do a lot of, of uh, physical things here, enjoy life physically, all these kinds of things. But, folks, all of that is rubbish. You can't take any of it with you. The only thing that's eternal is our relationship with Jesus Christ. And if that's the only thing that's eternal, then why aren't we spending our time devoted to that cause? Developing and strengthening that relationship. That is the purpose for us as believers, for Christ. Now, when you go to your work, you do that for Christ. When you, go, when you minister, when you witness, when you serve, when you come to church, when you do whatever it is you do, you do it for Christ. Because that's what's eternal. And that is your purpose and my purpose. And then we have the pattern for the believer. We have the plan, the prospect, the purpose, and now we have the pattern for the believer. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, it says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. What is the pattern for you as a believer? Well, the verse says that it ought to be our pattern. If you look at that verse, it says it ought to be our pattern. That means it ought to be normal uh, daily activity that we know Christ. That we know Christ. That we know Christ. You see, this is an ongoing thing. This is a, a growing thing. None of us know Christ this side of heaven in His fullness, in His completeness. Because we're sinful people. 
And we can't know Him in His fullness, in His completeness, until we get to heaven. And so this is a process that we're always going through, continuing to grow in the Lord, to know Christ. Now, what I want you to see in that verse is this, uh, verse 10, that I, Paul's talking that I may know Him. And here's the pattern. I want you to notice the pattern. And the power of His resurrection. You see, Paul's saying, I, I want to know the power of His resurrection. I want it to be made more known to me and more known, more applied to my life. He goes on to say, and the fellowship of his sufferings. Paul's saying he wants to be a part of his family, and he's saying uh, Christ suffered for you and for me, for all people. And so Paul's saying, I must suffer for the sake of other people, to be used of God, of Jesus Christ in this manner, so that he could identify with Christ also in suffering. And then finally he says, being conformed to his death. Scripture says, to die to yourself to pick up your cross and to follow after Christ. That's a self-denial. That's putting ourself, that's putting yourself, myself, uh, to death. That is that we put the needs of Jesus Christ or, or His desires and the needs of other people above our own. Is this a pattern in your life? As you survey your life the last few years, or maybe even uh, longer than that, do you see this pattern in your life? Paul is saying that this is the pattern for us as believers. This is, this is what we ought to be striving for. This is the way we ought to be living. And then we have the power for the believer. The power for the believer. In uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Some of you have that memorized. It's your favorite verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see, our power, your power as a believer, comes through Jesus Christ who strengthens you. Let me ask you this. Do you believe all things are possible? See, that's a pretty easy question. Most of us say, yeah, I believe all things are possible. Okay, well, let me make it more personal. Do you believe that you can be all that God has for you to be? Do you believe those sin habits that are in your life, God can change? Do you believe those bad habits that you have, that God can take a hold of those? Make them no longer a part of your life. Do you believe that God can take your finances if you'll give it over to Him, allow you to obey His commandment to tithe and still take care of your needs? You see, when we make it a more personal situation, do I believe? Do I believe that all things are possible in Christ who strengthens me? It's easy to say we believe that in a general sense. But when we apply it to our own lives, do I believe? Some of us are in people sharing Jesus. And so uh, those of you that are in that class or those of you that are, that are wanting to share Jesus with other people, do you believe He's going to equip you and enable you to share Jesus with other people? He will. He wants to. But you must believe and you must have faith and you must step forward and be like Isaiah and say, Here I am, Lord, send me. Use me. I'm available. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because if we uh, doubt or if we lack this, this confidence or this faith, you're not only limiting yourself, but you're limiting Jesus Christ. Jesus says that you and I can do all things. He didn't say some things. He didn't say, uh, uh, you know, every third thing that you desire, that you can do all things. That is unlimited. So dream your dreams. And I'm talking in a spiritual sense. Dream your dreams. God will enable you to fulfill those if you believe. You see, we can do all things in Christ not because of our gifts, not because of our talents, or maybe the lack thereof, but because of Jesus Christ who lives within us and gives us the power to do it. You ever heard of the uh, legal term called power of attorney? Now, when you have a, if you have the power of attorney or if you give it to someone else, this is what happens. If I were to give the power of attorney over to someone else, I would sign away that this person, whoever this person is, has all the rights and privileges that I have and that they can do anything on my behalf that they want to do. I've signed away everything, all responsibilities, rights, privileges to another person. You have the power of attorney. If you belong in the family of God, you have the power of attorney because Jesus has signed away your ability. 
his privileges and rights and what he wants to accomplish and what he did accomplish, he has given to you. You have the power of attorney. You remember Jesus saying, right before he left, he told his disciples, you know all the great things I did? Y'all are going to do even bigger and better things. He signed away. He said, y'all can do more than, than I ever did. Not because of them, but because he knew who was going to be in control. That through the power of the Holy Spirit, by those of us that believe we truly can do all things, we have the power of attorney. You want to break down the walls of certain things? Denominationalism or beliefs or love or a hindrance? You've got the power of attorney. You want to witness to somebody? You have the power of attorney. You want the, the Lord to do a, a, a fantastic thing in your life, in someone's life, you've got the power of attorney. Do you believe, though? Do you believe you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you? We are, of course, talking this evening about godliness, that is, purity uh, for a believer. Now, we've looked at the way of the Christian. We've looked at the worth of a Christian. Now I want us to look at the walk of a real Christian, the walk of a real a Christian. You see, a real Christian has fruit, the way of a Christian. There's fruit, there's evidence that you are, that I am a Christian. And we have worth, we have value because of Him who lives within us. And then we have the walk of a real Christian. In Amos chapter 3, verse 3, it says, Do two men walk together unless they have made an appointment? Now, as I look at that verse, do two men walk together unless they've made an appointment? He's saying this. You can't be in unison. You can't have unity. You can't be in agreement. You cannot accomplish the goals that you have for yourself unless you are united, unless you're walking the same way, unless you're walking towards the same goal. And that's what's being said to us as Christians. We can't do all that God has called us to do unless we're walking in unity with Him. Unless we're after the same things. The goal is the same. The passion and the love and the desire are the same. Well, first of all, we have the place the walk commences. We have the place that the walk commences. You see, anytime two people walk together, there's a starting point. They meet somewhere, and then they start their journey together. Now, for believers, this place where this walk commences is at Calvary. That's where the walk starts. That's where it gets its beginning. Christ paid the price. And He died for you and He died for me. And if we are going to receive uh, that, that gift of salvation, where do we meet Him at? We meet Him at the cross. At the cross. That's where our walk begins. Our walk began nowhere else. Not in a church building. Not anywhere else. It began at the cross. Our walk began there because years prior to that, the walk ceased in the garden. You see, the walk initially, as God had it laid out, would begin in the garden. But Adam and Eve fell short. They sinned. And because of that, they were escorted out of that garden. And so the beginning place is no longer the garden. It's at Calvary. That's where our walk begins. And then we have the price that the walk costs. The price that the walk costs. Now, this walk with Jesus Christ has an enormous price to it. First of all, it cost Him His blood. You see, Jesus gave up His life in order for us to have this walk. In order for us to have this relationship, He gave up His life. And Jesus says that the gift of salvation to you and to me and, and the world is free, but here's what it's going to cost you to live the Christian life and to live it victoriously. It's going to cost you everything. It's going to cost you your life. It, he's saying, you've got to give up the world. You've got to give it all up. That's what it costs you. It costs Jesus' life. It costs you and me, the world. It costs us everything. The gift of salvation is free, but the walk of a Christian costs us our life, just as Jesus gave up His life. Scripture says, do not be conformed. That is, don't let the world intimidate you. Don't let the philosophy of this world, don't let the ways of this world muddle your mind or get you off track. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And this secular society that we live in, it's very easy to get off track. It's very easy to begin adopting the ideas of this world. 
that, especially in this country. But if we are transforming our minds because we're reading our Bible every day, we're studying God's Word, we know what He has to say, we're growing in our walk and we're growing in our relationship, that's what transforming of the mind means. So that when someone throws out a gospel that sounds unfamiliar, God will be able to recall Scripture to our minds and our, the Holy Spirit will work in our heart and go, nope, that's not right. There's something not right about what they're saying. That's the renewing of your mind. The price, the, cost, the what cost. Cost Jesus his life, it costs us the world. And then the pace that the walk continues. The pace, the walk continues. There is a pace. First of all, it's with two people. It's you as an individual with Christ. See, while you're walking with Christ, I'm walking with Christ, and other people are walking with Christ. And your walk is going to be at a different pace than my walk, and vice versa. But it is... Uh, uh, it is with Christ. All of us are, are unified in that. In fact, when I wrote this, I couldn't help but think of, of uh, Lisa and Kelly singing that song that they sang a few weeks ago. And I forget the title of the song, but in the song they sang, it said, uh, uh, Our faith is going to grow, sometimes fast and sometimes slow. But it is going to grow. And you see, that's the pace that I'm talking about. Sometimes we get into a growth spurt, like our children have a growth spurt. It's like, wow, they're three or four inches taller than they were just a short time ago. Our faith is like that. Sometimes we go through a period of time where it's like, we've just grown so much. And then there's those periods of time when we don't really seem to be growing at all. We're just sort of at a standstill. And that's not necessarily a bad thing if we're still trying to grow in the Lord. It might mean that He's just sort of letting us settle down from that growth spurt, to digest it, to begin to live out those things that we're learning. But there is a pace. Sometimes it's going to be fast. Sometimes it's going to be slow. I've seen it in my own life. Sometimes it were incredibly slow. And then it seems like the last several years it's been on a real quick pace. And, uh, and so there's going to be some changes. It'll be sometimes slow, sometimes fast. The thing that we need to remember is that the pace needs to be dictated not by our will, but by His. By His pace. He needs to be the one to set the pace not us. The walk of a believer begins at the cross of Jesus Christ and continues with His blood and His grace. Now, our walk is not solitary. That is, we don't do this alone, for we walk with a Savior, Jesus Christ, and we walk towards purity and we walk towards godliness. That is the walk of a real Christian. And then fourthly, finally, we have the witness, the witness of a real Christian. In John 13, 35, it says, By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. If you have love. We talked about in people sharing Jesus that we can use all kinds of techniques. We can razzle and dazzle with all kinds of words. But folks, we're not going to win people to the Lord if we don't love Him. We are not going to win people to the Lord if we don't love one another. We are not going to win people to the Lord if we don't love our neighbors regardless of their lifestyle. We've got to love people. That's our witness. Two things I want to make note of here. How we are marked. As a witness, now we, we're, we're a witness. Sometimes it's bad, sometimes it's good, but we are a witness. Uh, Jesus said that, that you are going to be my witnesses. First of all in Jerusalem, then in Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. He didn't say you might be. He said we are going to be. Now the question we have to ask is are we going to be an effective witness or no witness at all, a detriment. And so we see how we are marked. How are we marked? First of all, by what we forsake. As Christians, we are marked by what we forsake. When people see our lifestyle and we say, uh, no, I'm not going to go to that movie because it's against my beliefs. I don't think it's a clean movie to see. I'm not going to watch that TV program. I'm not, to go to, I'm not going to go to that particular place because it's against what I think uh, God wants me to do. It's by what we forsake. I'm not going to read this material. I'm not going to talk in that certain way. I'm not going to tell these kinds of jokes. We are marked by what we forsake. Make no mistake about it. People are watching you. They're watching to see if you're actually living out what your mouth is saying. And if they don't match up, you're going to have a hard time winning others to the Lord. We are marked by what we feed on. You've heard the expression, uh, garbage in, garbage out. It works the other way around also. 
righteousness in or righteousness out. If we are feeding on God's Word, if we're feeding on prayer, we're feeding on fellowship, we're feeding on these righteous and holy things, then that's what our walk is going to be. That's the way we're going to talk. That's the way we're going to act. That's the way we're going to think by what we feed on. Now, if we're feeding on a bunch of garbage, then that's what we're going to think, and that's the way we're going to live, and that's the way we're going to talk, and, those, and that's how we're going to associate with people. We are marked by what we feed on. And then we are marked by who we fellowship with. Who do you desire to spend your time with? Is it fellow brothers and sisters, or is it people of the world? Who do you spend your time with? Now, I want to be sure that you all understand this point. Jesus went to all kinds of people, and he associated with all kinds of people, and we need to also. We don't need to, to form a little cluster somewhere and just be by ourselves like some people do. We are to be in the world so that we can be salt and light into the world. But we need to have balance there. We don't need to be spending all our free time with people of the world because they're probably going to change us before we change them. So who do we fellowship with? Who do you spend most of your time with? Is it with God's people or is it with people of the world? Spend time with God. If you, if you want to spend time with the people of the world because you like them or whatever, which is great, then why don't you have them come to our fellowships? We have a good time. We would love to have them come. We don't put anybody on the spot. Let them see how God's people love. Let them see how God's people laugh. We have a good time. We ought to have a good time. I can think of no better way to have a good time than celebrating with God's people, laughing and enjoying each other. How we are marked. Secondly, how we are manifest. How we are manifest. How are we made known? How do others see us? First of all, we are different through Christ. We are different through Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now, when we became a member in the family of God, that old person that we knew is no longer. We are made new. Now, we still have the same bodies, but inside we are a completely new person. We are a, a newborn baby in the family of God. And that's why he's saying old things have passed away. That is, he's given us a new desire, a desire to live righteously. And people ought to see that difference in our life. Has someone come up to you lately and said, you know, you're, you're different than you used to be. I've noticed that you're different. Have they said that to you? That, that can mark uh, for you a boundary that says, yes, I'm growing in the Lord. People are seeing a difference in my life. I'm not doing those same things. I'm not talking the same way. I'm more focused on Christ. We are different through Christ. Secondly, we are directed. We are directed by Christ. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 19 and 20, um, it says, And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and they followed him. See, here's what happened here. They were doing their thing. They were working. They were, they were performing their call. They, they were called to be fishermen at this time. And Jesus said, hey, if you leave what you're doing, I'll make you fishers of men. In other words, Jesus was giving, a, giving them a new direction. And we have no evidence in Scripture that they quibbled about that. We have no evidence that says they, they questioned Jesus about that, that, that they said, no, I kind of like it right here where I'm at. Because they let Jesus direct their life. I've heard of people uh, in, in seminary, and you probably have heard of some, that God had a call for their life, a specific call, and they wrestled with God and they fought with God, and, and it's because they didn't let Him direct their life. If you want an uh, uh, example of that in Scripture, go to Jonah. Jonah ran hard from God. He, he did everything he could do to escape what God wanted him to do. But in the end, he did what God wanted him to do. I believe Jonah missed out on a lot of blessings because he didn't listen initially. And so is God directing your life through Jesus Christ? He wants to, but we've got to yield ourselves to him. We need to stop what we're doing, find out what God wants, and then be focused in that direction. Thirdly, we are delighted in Christ. We are delighted in Christ. In Psalm uh, chapter 37, verse 4, it says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord. You know, I think you've been around me long enough to know I like to have a good time. I enjoy laughing. I enjoy 
uh, uh, just messing around. And uh, I like delighting in the Lord. I, I like having a good time. And I hope you do too. Uh, otherwise, I'll probably aggravate you a little bit. Might even needle at you a little bit. I wouldn't do that. We need to... to yes, I would do I know. We, <laughs> we need to delight in the Lord. We need to be delighted by His presence, by His fellowship, by what He's done in our life, what He's going to do. Folks, that is fun. It is a privilege. It is a blessing. I can't think of anything else that's more fun than that, of actually seeing things come true right in front of your face. You know, we look at Scripture and we see all these uh, miraculous things that God did, a part of the Red Sea and, and brought people from the dead, and, and those were great things. But because of these uh, uh, events, we tend to forget what He's doing right in our own midst. We miss out on the miracles He's doing right in front of us. As He changes your life, that's a miracle. As He changes my life, that's a miracle. As He brings people to our fellowship and the church grows and there's excitement and anticipation, that is a miracle. That is our Red Sea experience. Delight in the Lord and He will give the desires of your heart. You ever stop for a moment and just write, you know, wrote down or thought about what you'd like the Lord to do? I don't mean as a Santa Claus, gimme, gimme, gimme. But I mean in spiritual terms, Lord, I'd like to see these things happen in my life. I'd like to see these things happen in the life of my family. I'd like to see these things happen in the life of this church. We have such a list on our Wednesday night prayer list. I'm very specific with God. God, I, I'd like to see you change lives. And, and one of the ways I'd like to see you do that is by this many people coming. Do you know God's been faithful to do that? We keep increasing those numbers. In fact, I've got to increase the next one. We've been praying for 80 people or more in Sunday school, and we've hit it for a month now. And so the Lord just scratches his head going, are you going to increase that or not? And I say, yeah, okay, we'll go to 90 now. And, uh, and you know what? I know the Lord's going to answer that too. Because his word says if we delight in him, he will give us the desires of our heart. As long as our desires match up with his, as long as we're in his will, he's going to do it. And I'm anxious to see it happen. Because personally, I'm anxious to get to that 100 mark. Then it'll be 125. No. Have you ever met a person that was sorry they got saved? I never have. You know, they might have been uh, in, in trying circumstances or they might have thought, wondered, you know, has God left them? But I've never really heard someone say out of their own mouth, I wish I'd have never gotten saved. I've never heard that, and I don't think that you have. Hope not. But we need to understand that salvation is the beginning. It's not the end. Too many Christians are going to get to heaven. They're going to enter the gates of heaven smelling like smoke. I mean, they're going to be singed by those fires and just barely get in those gates. I hope that none of us are like that. I hope that all of us understand that when we received Jesus Christ, that was the beginning of a fantastic journey. And we have to walk it. We have to travel that road. We have to. So that we can be made into the likeness of Jesus Christ so that we can be filled with godliness, so that we can be filled with purity. That's what God wants from each one of you, just as He wants it from me. Is that the kind of life that you're living? Is it the kind of life that you're desirous of, to, to, to be a believer of purity? You know, it's, it's, it's impossible. It is impossible to live this godly life, this pure kind of life, without Jesus Christ. You can't live a pure life without Christ in your life. And so let me say, if there's anyone in here this evening that has never come to a point in your life where you've asked Jesus to come into your heart and to be your Savior, that's the beginning point of a journey that will last for eternity. For eternity. If you've never invited Jesus into your life, we'll have a time of invitation in just a few moments. And I want to ask you, if you would, to come into the aisle and come down and we'll pray together. And you can receive Jesus tonight as your personal Savior. Because it is impossible to have this kind of life, the abundant, joyful life, without Jesus Christ. It's all